Thank you, everybody. It's good to be here. So last fall, I taught an advanced college class in sociology called Social Problems at the Adult Correctional Institutions, otherwise known as the ACI, or in lay terms, the state prison. In this class, there were about 23 men ranging in age from 19 to 60-ish. So teaching in a prison in many ways is just like teaching anywhere else. We arranged our desks in a circle so that everybody could see everybody else. I had smart, dedicated students who were thoughtful and committed to learning. Um, like students on the outside or on the street, they sometimes struggled with writing. They wrote reflection papers. They participated in very lively class conversations. But there were a few important differences. So unlike my students on the outside, my incarcerated students don't have access to computers. Homework is handwritten and turned in on loose leaf. Um, this has the effect of making revising essays extremely difficult, and I get well acquainted with everybody's chicken scratch. Um, students in the prison have access to only a very limited library. There's not much sociology in there. They can't Google words that they don't understand. They can't use the internet to look up academic articles. Um, because I see them only once a week, teaching practices like office hours don't exist. I don't bump into my students around campus. Um, I only, you know, again, I only see them once a week. My students wear prison uniforms, and I have to lock my cell phone in the car and wear a little emergency buzzer on a cord around my neck. But apart from these things, you know, teaching, teaching sociology in a prison is very much like teaching sociology anywhere else. So sociology is the study of human society and of the patterns of our lives. And so in a class on social problems, you know, we spent the first two-thirds of the semester talking about everything that was socially problematic, so everything that was wrong with the world, ranging from inequality to racism to uh, addiction to climate change. And then we spent the last third of the semester talking about how people try to fix social problems, talking about how people try to make their world better. So last year, Rhode Island increased the tipped minimum wage, and I used this campaign as an example for my students of how social change can come about. Um, so if the social problem is a low wage for tipped workers, then the way that Rhode Island chose to solve it was through collaboration between labor organizers, between policy advocates, and state legislators. So normally, when I teach a class on the outside, I send my students out into the world to either shadow somewhere or interview people as a way to understand what's going on. Um, obviously, in a prison, I can't do that. So I brought the community in, a labor organizer, a policy advocate, and a state representative all visited my class to talk about their role in solving the social problem of low wages for tipped workers. Now, the students peppered the visitors with questions. They loved it. And I think they were particularly touched that an elected state official would come in and talk about his role in social change with them. For many of them, it was the first time that uh, a person in a position of power had paid them much attention, much less given them any respect. So the class ends about a month later. The guys turn in their final papers. We all go about our lives, and everything's great. You know, I start teaching in a different facility, so I didn't see those students around anymore. But a couple weeks ago, I was at the Rhode Island State House for an unrelated reason, and I ran into the state rep who had visited my class. Hey, are you here because he's coming? He asked. Who's coming? I said. Ah, one of your former students. So apparently, upon his release, one of my former students, a young man by the name of Alan, had looked up this state representative, called him up, asked for an internship, and he was due at the State House to start that internship in a matter of minutes, and the delicious coincidence was that I happened to be there as this transpired. So I went down to the security checkpoint um, at the, in the doors of the State House, and I waited for him to show up. And show up he did. He had cut his hair, he had his dignity restored to him in his street clothes, and he was eager and confident. Um, and when he came in, I almost exploded with pride. And that was a really defining moment for me. So somebody who gets out of prison and gets an internship in the state government shortly thereafter is a model of reintegration. He is a testament to education, he's a testament to the power of voice, and he's a testament to his own drive to make something of his life. So Alan is one of many people in the Rhode Island prison system who are participants in this CCRI, the Community College of Rhode Island, um, education program. 
20 years ago, federal uh, money was prohibited from being used for education in prisons, but now such programs are starting to emerge again. And this is happening because lawmakers, ranging from President Obama to state legislators here in Rhode Island, are looking for ways to get better results from the $80 billion that the United States spends every year on incarceration. So here in Rhode Island, incarcerated students can earn up to an associate's degree through the Community College of Rhode Island and the Department of Corrections Special Education Program. Um, thus far, they have awarded 60 associate's degrees and three bachelor's degrees, and there will be another graduation ceremony this June. Yeah, yeah. You clap for them, not for me. But anyway, um, this is coming about because of some promising data. So uh, education has been shown to dramatically reduce recidivism rates. And what that means is that somebody who earns a degree while in prison has only a 1% chance of returning to prison for a parole violation or another crime. The average rate is 67.8%. Education helps good things happen. We should be understanding it as a constructive use of our time and our resources. And Rhode Island is trying out this approach, and that's how I came to be teaching sociology in our prisons. So, as I said, sociology is the study of human society, and throughout the course of the semester, we talk about a whole range of things, you know, including gender inequity, including globalization, including political economy, organizations, etc. Now, as a sociology teacher, I'm a bit of an evangelist for sociology. I think everyone should take a class in it, and the world would be a better place. Um, but it has the potential to be a particularly meaningful discipline in a prison. Um, again, it is the study of the invisible and the visible structures that pattern our lives, and so I like to think about it as giving students and, and people, right, tools to sort of break apart and examine things that contribute to their social worlds, including, you know, oppression, violence, addiction, inequality, and things like that. So, Incarcerated students are expected, just like my students anywhere else, um, to write one to two page reflection papers each week on their assigned reading. Um, writing is, to my mind, one of the most important liberal arts competencies, and it's part of my job as a professor to help students find their voices, right? So their tones in writing that, most, that permit them to most clearly express themselves. Um, these, these reflection papers, which in my class are called think pieces, um, are typically of an extraordinarily high caliber from the students who are in prison, and they, they offer insights both into the people who serve time and into the social dynamics that contribute to all of our lives. So, last fall, um, a student in the men's medium security facility wrote a very, very compelling think piece on the topic of public education. We had been studying institutions in class, and he had been reading the textbook as well as a supplementary piece by a well-known academic turned, turned journalist, a guy named Jonathan Kozel, who some of you may know. There are many forms, levels, and degrees of racial inequality, but preying on children and sabotaging their education so that they will eventually become easy victims of the judicial system must be the lowest form, he wrote in that think piece. I underline the sentence. I, I frequently underline sentences when I'm reading student homework because I find things that are compelling or they stand out in some way or they're well written. And so when I graded his paper, I made a little note to this effect. And I said, hey, this has sort of the skeleton of a good op-ed. Now, an op-ed is an opinion and editorial piece like you frequently see in the newspaper. It's a longer version of a letter to, letter to the editor. Um, so this student's homework identified a relevant problem in the news, it explained why it was important. It proposed a solution. And this particular one was of unsurpassed eloquence, particularly for somebody who had been initially really hesitant to participate in class, didn't speak that much. So, you know, I wrote this down on the edge of his homework, which was handwritten like all student homework, and I gave him back his paper. So the next week, this student, whose name is Aaron Carpenter, surprised me. He gave me back his homework, which he had revised, and he asked for help placing it as an op-ed. So we received permission from the prison authorities, and I started calling around local newspapers to see who might print it. Now, I didn't have much luck at first. Let's be honest. Prison carries a stigma. It's a place that people don't know very much about. It's a place that people are afraid of, and editors seem to think that lifting up the voice of someone who is incarcerated would be dangerous to their publication. But Bob Plain at Rhode Island Future called me back. 
and we had a phone conversation, and we ran Aaron's editorial a couple of days later. And it went viral. So I printed out a couple of copies of, of this editorial, and I brought them with me when I went back to class the following week. So Aaron hadn't seen this, of course, when it was published, because he doesn't have access to a computer at the ACI. But his expression when he saw his words in print, it was like sunrise coming up on his face. It's something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. So with more students clamoring for the opportunity to write, Bob and I figured we'd found a way to sort of combine our crafts to facilitate constructive civic participation from students on the inside. Publication demonstrated for Aaron that he could still make a positive, constructive difference, even from within a prison. And publication demonstrated to society that incarcerated people have a great deal to offer. Um, and so the prison op-ed project was born at that juncture, and this is basically how it works. So with my help and with some editorial assistance from Rhode Island Future, students learn to make arguments that are based on reasoning and evidence rather than anecdote and hyperbole. They learn to shape those arguments for a public audience. They get a soapbox. Um, and for most, in most cases, for the very first time, they get access to a public readership. So the Prison Op-Ed Project has been up and running for about a year and a half. And in that time, 28 students and one US senator have written and published op-eds. Um, and they've written and published them on a wide variety of issues. Uh, many of them write about education, both about the vocational opportunities that exist as well as the state of public schools in Rhode Island and elsewhere. Others write about criminal justice policy. One wrote about a practice that was outlawed in Rhode Island in 2014 in which people are sentenced to prison not based on their crimes, but rather on demographic risk factors, such as family background and neighborhood of residence. One young woman used a social psychology reading to explore her own relationship with alcoholism. People wrote about gender, in this case about how women's facilities and men's facilities differ and that women don't have access to the same quality of outdoor space as men do. This student wrote about the very high court costs that people incur as they are getting out of prison. This is a process that leaves you owing thousands of dollars as you try to start fresh. So when this op-ed was published, it piqued the interest of Channel 10 News, and an investigative reporter actually got permission to go back into the prison and conduct a follow-up interview with a student whose name was Chris. Um, and in this case, Chris's writing and thinking was amplified not just by his op-ed, but also by Channel 10 News, which we in Rhode Island know is a pretty big deal. And then one of the saddest experiences I have ever had. Last June, a student named Michael Wheelock wrote a piece entitled, Post-Prison Services Would Stem the System's Revolving Door. And in it, he talked about the hard tasks of finding and maintaining employment and housing after release from prison, um, particularly given the fact that many people struggle with mental health issues um, and substance abuse issues and struggled with those before they went into prison. These barriers, he said, and in his words, often lead people to return to drugs and self-medicate themselves right back to prison. So we published this, this op-ed, and several months later, we published a different op-ed by a different student. Um, and because our semester had ended, I mailed him his op-ed um, instead of bringing it into him. And a couple weeks later, I got this letter in reply. Dear Megan, it read, thank you for sending the printout of the op-ed published on rifuture.org. I really appreciate it. The reason for my letter is that on page two, it lists the names of other prisoners who have had op-eds written and published. As I was reviewing the names, I came across Michael Wheelock and the title of Post-Prison Services Would Stem the System's Revolving Door. Of course, I can't read it without access to a computer. Regretfully to inform you, Michael Wheelock is dead. He went home from prison on February 1st and died of a drug overdose. It is not known whether it was an accident or self-inflicted. Michael was in my counseling group here, so I knew him well. We did have our differences, but it really surprised me. I wonder if some of the post-prison services that Michael was reaching for in his op-ed could or would have prevented his death. 
I wonder as well, Michael was using his voice to advocate for a change that he felt was necessary. Um, and that change, if it comes, will come too late for him. This letter reminded me afresh of what the stakes are, not just for prison education, but for any education. People's lives are literally on the line. Rest in peace, Michael Wheelock. People often ask me if I'm afraid to go and work in the prison, and the answer is no, I am absolutely not. Um, the prison is full of human beings. Human beings have made mistakes, but who hasn't made mistakes? Um, if I start each semester thinking of my class as a room full of drug dealers and sex offenders and murderers, it's a non-starter. It's a non-starter, right? And if I do that, I've already blocked out that which is good in my students. I've dehumanized them and I'm not leaving them any space to grow into any better expressions of themselves, and we all need space to grow into better expressions of ourselves. It doesn't interest me what people did to get into prison, right? But if I'm going to teach them to think, and later to write, I have to engage with their humanity. And in order to do that, I have to offer them my own humanity in return. It's our hope that the Prison Op Ed Project, through the writing of these uh, really remarkable students, offers people in Rhode Island and elsewhere a chance to engage with their humanity as well. So finding your voice and learning to write for the public, I believe, is the most, one of the most important parts of both being a student and being a citizen. And it's our hope, again, that the, the Prison Op Ed Project provides people with an opportunity to step into better and more critical and more articulate expressions of themselves, not just for themselves, but also for the world. Maya Angelou once said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. An idea is powerless if it just stays there locked away, right? For me, sociology and teaching sociology is all about finding ways to frame and make sense of our ideas. And the Prison Op Ed Project is all about finding ways to tell the stories that matter. So I'd like to end today by introducing two brave storytellers who I have had the privilege to teach over the course of the past couple years. Former writers from the Prison Op Ed Project, David Brown and Darnell High. Come on out, you guys. You want to take a bow? Take a little bow? All right. 